Oh, yeah. All right. The, the first thing I have to say is um, you were asked to turn off your technology. I don't know if you saw The Office two weeks ago. Do you, does anyone watch The Office? So I know Steve Carell isn't on it anymore. But um, The Office, when, when uh, Brian they made him take his cell phone away and he couldn't handle it, he's like, I just need to go be with my phone. And he left. <laughs> and so I kind of feel that way right now. Like, uh, no technology. I don't know if I could be where you guys are. So God bless you and have mercy on your souls. is what I'm trying to say. Uh, no, it's a pleasure to be here and um, to talk with you. What I want to actually do is, <laughs> if that was set up, that was brilliant. <laughs> so, so Give a hand, everyone. Yay. <laughs> Go be with your phone. <laughs> uh, that was cool. Uh, so what I, wanna, I don't know how to recover from that. So uh, what I want to do with our time, and I think we have... Um, a little less than an hour and a half, and I can talk way too long, so someone will just have to pull me off of here. Skip, you can pull me off when we're done. But I want to talk about this thing called identity, which I think is a prime driver of both youth ministry and young adult ministry. And if there's one thing that's really happening within the youth ministry world is that um, there's been this awakening to the fact that we have this group of young adults that um, have come about, people 18 to 35, really, and that the church is really falling down um, severely on how to do ministry with them. And I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go. But this question, who am I, I think is a, a real prime one. And so I want to look at that question through a little bit of social theory, and then we'll take kind of a theological turn as we go and what this means um, for ministry. So let me start by telling you just a, a really quick story um, about this whole thing of identity and answering this question, who am I, and how I think that's changed a little bit. Um, my wife is actually uh, a pastor. She's a PCUSA pastor, and she's actually the talented person in our family. So the seminary we were at, she had actually won the preaching prize for the seminary, which came with a fairly substantial amount of money, and the whole idea of the money was to actually travel with it. So most people would take the money and go to Oxford or Cambridge and spend nine months. And the whole idea was that you'd have an international experience, and that would make you a more well-rounded person as you went into the pulpit. Well, a few people before us had actually taken the money and traveled around the world with it. And when we found that out, we were like, yeah, that's what we're doing. We're, we're going around the world. So we were in L.A., and we took everything we owned and put it in a 6 by 10 storage site. Got rid of the lease of our apartment, opened up a P.O. box, literally had no home, and got on a plane and flew west. Now, we figured it was God's will, and we were going west, so we had to spend 10 days in Hawaii. I mean, you know, it just had to do it. I mean, it just seemed the right thing to do. We finally ended up in Melbourne, Australia, at the University of Melbourne, at um, Whitley College, and we were staying in this little damp, gross little flat. And it was actually in that little, gross, damp flat that we picked our identities, that we chose what we would do with our lives, that we were in our early 20s, had just finished seminary, that we decided what we would do. My wife decided she'd become an ordained pastor. I decided I would try to become an academic theologian, and we picked it. Our family was thousands of miles away. We had no church community around, and we just picked our identity on our own. And I think there maybe it's an illusion, but there's this kind of sense that part of what you do when you're a young adult or when you're an adolescent is decide who you are and answer this question, who am I? And that somehow it's up to us that we get to decide who we are. Now, it's kind of unique because I think that this is really a question of modernity, and one of the things we could say is that youth ministry itself is a creation of modernity. And that adolescence as a concept, as a social construction, really happens within modernity itself. And I think it has a lot to do with this creation of this, of this idea that you get to answer this question, who am I? I think for most of human history, and I'm overstating this a little bit, but for most of human history, you didn't get to answer this question. I mean, you, it was answered for you. Once a peasant, I don't like a peasant. Some historians actually say it's not until the 17th century and after that they found um, a number of personal journals. That they don't even think really people sat around and thought, well, who am I? What am I going to do with my life? What's the point of me being me? But it doesn't seem like it's till you know, into the 18th, 19th century that people start to ask that question. Now, there's exceptions to the rule, of course. Augustine's Confession is one of those. But not the average person, they don't think, did that much. Now, I want to show you a diagram. And my wife always says that uh, you need to be on drugs to understand my diagram. So what I'm saying is smoke them if you got them. All right, ready? All right, so um, one way to think about this, and this kind of leans on the work of Anthony Giddens, who's a British sociologist, is that... Here, standing in the present, for most of, the present, for most of human history, we were past-looking people. And we essentially looked to the past. If you were going to survive in the future, you had to harvest the wisdom of the past. 
the, the wisdom of your ancestors, your fathers and your mothers. And you were trying to correlate your life towards the past so that you might successfully live into the future. And we got to that past through a tradition, a traditional way of living our lives. And so we were bound by space and time and usually had one single narrative. Now what some of these social theorists actually think now is that we're no longer past-looking people, but we're actually future-looking people. And that we're, that's actually our future that we are looking towards. So to such an extent, this is actually shameful for me to say, but it's true. I don't know if it's true for you, but I don't know the names of my great-grandparents. I don't know their names. Now, the crazy thing is my grandmother has told me their names many times, but I can't remember it. And again, this is shameful, but they don't make any difference in my life. They make no difference in my life, so I can't hold on to their names. Because I'm not trying to live my life in kind of correlation to who they are. I'm living my own life. Now, I'm sure all of you have seen the very um, successful and important historical documentary, animated documentary called The Prince of Egypt. Remember The Prince of Egypt? A couple, maybe ten, ten, ten years old. Yeah, so it's the history of you know the Exodus done by Steven Spielberg and animated. So it's completely historically accurate. Um, and I don't know if you remember this scene, but my son, who is now seven, but when he was about four, he was so into this movie. And we would allow him to watch it. And it became an existential crisis for his mother, who's a pastor, and his father, who teaches at a seminary one day, when he said, you know, Mommy, I don't like Moses. I like the Pharaoh. That's why I was like, no, you're missing the point. That's not the point. You're supposed to like Moses. He's like, no, I like the Pharaoh. So we would allow him to watch this, and we'd allow him to watch it for about 20 minutes a day. And I'm sitting there watching him watch this thing, and there's this scene, which I'm, I'm, I'm sure this is historically accurate, but if, you're, if you've seen it, you'll remember it. It's the scene where Ramses, who will become the pharaoh, he's a teenager, and so is Moses. See, it's historically accurate. They're teenagers. And uh, they go on a drag race, uh, a chariot drag race through Cairo, and this is how the Sphinx loses its nose. And I mean, do you remember the scene? They're knocking all this over. Well, at the end of it, after they've had their drag race, the ruling pharaoh, Ramses' father, calls him in and berates him. doesn't really worry about Moses, but it's to Ramses because he will be, he's the prince, he will be the ruling pharaoh. And he berates him and says, Ramses, don't you understand? One weak link in a chain destroys dynasty. And I'm sitting there watching my little toe-headed son watch this and take in every, every bit of it without blinking. And I'm thinking as he's, as he's berating him, calling him back to the past, that you have to live in a way that honors your ancestors. I'm looking at this kid thinking, I have not honor raising this boy. And there is no way I'm raising this boy to live in honor of his past ancestors, to live in the way of the roots for the next generation. That's not my goal. My goal as a parent is helping be a self-differentiated individual who can grasp his own person enough that he can go out in the world and make a life for himself. I'm not trying to get him to correlate to the past. Now what happens is when we become future-oriented people, according to the German social theorist Sigmund Bauman, um, he says that the day the all-encompassing community was punctured, was the day talk of identity began. That for most of human history, you didn't ask this question. But now it becomes our primary question that starts in adolescence and moves through young adulthood, which is, who am I? Who are you? How do you answer this question? Now, in the middle of the 20th century, I think we answered this question in two ways, in two ways that I think have not held up very well, and I think lead into a number of issues in the context of ministry. But the two ways I think you answered this question originally, who am I? In the middle of the 20th century, back in the 1950s, when everything in the church was perfect. I say that with complete sarcasm. Uh, but we tend to imagine that. That the way you constructed your identity were around two building blocks. The first was really your skills and your abilities. In other words, you answer this question, who am I, by discovering what you were good at. So around the age of 15, which is why we tend to assume that adolescence, its primary driving task is to figure out your identity, that you would figure out at uh, 15 what you were good at. So you figure out you're really good at math, or you figure out you're really good at breaking into cars, and that becomes part of your identity. So if you're really good at math, you go to college, you major in math, you get a math degree, you get out of college, you apply for a job, you get a job, and when you meet somebody at a dinner party, you say, hi, my name's Bob, and I'm an accountant. That's who I am. That's my identity. My identity really rests around my work. It rests around, around what I do. But it wasn't just really your Identity wasn't just really built around your work, but it was also built around your love. So sometime between the ages of you know, 15, 16, 17, 22, 23, you'd find your sweetheart, you'd get married, you'd have 2.5 children, um, at least demographically. That's why if you watch The Simpsons, Maggie never grows up. 
because she always they always have 2.5. So you learn a lot of really important things coming to this um, colloquium. But you you'd find your sweetheart, you would get married, you would have kids, you'd start volunteering for the PCA or for Little League, and when you met someone at a dinner party, you would be your job, but you would also be a husband or wife. And that was really what you did. So you were not only an accountant, but you were a husband or a wife. And your identity really revolved around your work and around your love. It's then no wonder, actually, that Sigmund Freud, who, um, if you know anything about Freud, he wasn't really into talking about healthy people. You know, like, what got Freud up in the morning were people having dreams of their genitalia falling out. That was like, wow, this is going to be a, a fun day. This is going to be exciting. He didn't really like talking about healthy people. But the little he said about healthy people, Freud actually said the healthy person is the person who can work and can love. The healthy person is a person who can work and can love. And for the most part, you can have a pretty solid identity, a pretty solid self-definition for yourself, because work and love were pretty dependable forces, pretty dependable things that you could build your identity around. Now, I think what's happened in our own time is that these things have melted some, and they haven't held up very well. In other words, work and love may not be what it used to be, and it throws this kind of solid identity up in the air. For instance, we've seen this melting of work lately. Um, it's almost absurd now for us to imagine that young people in our congregation at 15 will pick what they want to do with the rest of their lives and then do it. You know, it's almost laughable. And how many people do you know that say things like, well, you know, I'm 41 and I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. Which isn't to say that they are lazy and uncommitted. It's just to say that the workforce changes. You were doing what you wanted to do for a while. It was going to change. And now you had to figure out something else. And there was always about this adaptability. Um, but it's absurd now for us to, uh, to assume that a 15-year-old figures out that she's really good at this and she's going to do that with the rest of her life. I mean, almost no one, I'm overstating this probably, but almost no one gets jobs in their majors anymore. I mean, you don't go to college to learn what you're going to do with the rest of your life to learn skills. You go to college to learn how to drink. That's the point. You know? I mean, that's why parents pay all this money. You go to learn how to drink. Um, and then you think in our congregations that... You know, who, with, with, corporate, with corporate mergers and downsizing, I mean, who stays with one company for a long period of time? Now, the statistics are always changing, but at least some of them I saw said that Americans change careers. Not jobs, but careers. Every 20 months. So every 20 months, like you were in the insurance business and now you're in higher education, and you change careers every 20 months. Now, I think those statistics may be challenged, but you could see the fluidity of that. Yes? The way that I understand the statistics, now I would have to look at them again, the way I understand but it's radically changed careers. Like you're doing something radically different, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah, so some of us may live this, this narrative out right here. So, I mean, there's just fewer and fewer people in our congregations anymore that have to get gold watches. You know, the gold watch phenomenon where you work for one corporation for 40 or 50 years. I mean, there's still people in some of our churches who, who got these, but it's becoming a rare thing with corporate downsizing and mergers and things like that, that you would get, that you would pick your job and that you would stay with that forevermore. But not only have we seen the melting of work lately, but we've also seen the melting of love. Well, that sounds very unromantic, doesn't it? Uh, but it is, it's true in the sense that it was once assumed that there was one love for one person. But now with late marriage, at high divorce rate, it's very unlikely that you fall in love once and stay with that person forevermore. Now, this radically, just these two things, the changing of work and love, radically changes the church or impacts the church. Now, I don't know if anyone's seen Robert Wolf now, who's a um, sociologist of religion at Princeton, his book, Religion After the Baby Boom. Has anyone seen this book? Um, some of you have seen it, and maybe you will qualify my um, recommendation of this book. But it is really boring. It is a really, really boring book. You rarely hear recommendations for books that start, this book was incredibly boring. But it was. It was a boring book, except the introduction and conclusion. So my recommendation to you is to go on Google Books and take a look at it. But the most interesting thing about what's now his argument is he basically says this. He says that um, religion, for some reason in the American consciousness, religion is a conventional category. In other words... You imagine you are someone who goes to a religious community when you are living a conventional way of life, which is defined as having a job with some upward mobility that you would call a career, having a mortgage, being married, and most radically having a child. 
And what's now his point is he actually shows in this book that the mainline decline, the drop of 12 to 14 percent, depending on the denomination of decline in mainline churches, he thinks has everything to do, statistically he thinks this, has everything to do with the loss of 18 to 35 year olds. They're just not in mainline churches. And he thinks that this is because religion is a conventional category. And what's happened as work and love have changed is that it's taking longer and longer for young adults to enter into quote-unquote conventional ways of life. So his point is that actually young adults, post-high school people, don't hate the church. These young people don't hate the church. It's actually more dire than that. They just don't think church matters. They just don't imagine that someone like them would ever even go to church, is what his argument basically is. So the fact that it's taking them until they're in their mid-30s before they end up married or they have a job. I mean, when you're living in your parents' basement and working at Starbucks while you're trying to start your van and then you move in with your boyfriend and then you move back home, I mean, this, this transition, what he says is not a conventional way of life. This is not conventionality in a sociological term. You just don't imagine that a religious community is for someone like you. Well, that leads to a really big theological question. Like, how the hell did it ever happen that Christianity is conventional? I mean, how did that ever happen in the American consciousness? But it seems to play that way out sociologically. This is a huge issue for the church when it comes to youth ministry. Because we're still living with an old paradigm that we used to assume that someone would graduate from high school at 18, and we kind of knew that they'd be gone. You know, they would go to college, and they would be out of the church, or they would come at Easter or come at Christmas, but we'd stay connected to them through their parents. But we could be pretty sure that they'd have this moratorium out of the church during their college years. But by the time they were 23, 24, if they were female or even younger than that, they would be married, and they would have a kid on the way, and they'd be back in the church. So we just kind of assumed these people would be back. But now we're dealing with this reality, it appears, where they graduated high school at 18, and it could be till they're 25, 26, 48, 30, 35, before, for some of them, it dawned on them that, hey, I should find a church. We just... We're having our first child here. I'm 35, 36. I should find a church. Um, and of course, many of them don't make it back. So this very changing of work and love has a really big impact, I think, on the church. So my overall point is that when work and love change, this idea that you can have one solid identity is kind of thrown up in the air as well. That my self-definitions really change with new jobs and new love. So now, on a Wednesday night, if you do your youth ministry program on a Wednesday night or a Monday night or whatever, when the 15-year-old daughter runs to the car of her mother, um, it's pretty. it could be that both of them are asking big identity questions. Like, who am I? If mom is going through a divorce or mom is going through a new job, both of them living under one roof may be asking, well, who am I? What's the point of my life? How do I answer this question of who I, who I am? So we've seen these transitions. Now, I think we've seen these transitions, and when it comes to building our identity, they've evolved in a certain way. There's something at the core of them that stays the same, but there's also something that I think has changed in a significant way. For instance, I think as an identity marker, as something we build our identities around, we've seen this transition from work, actually, to consumption. In other words, how I define myself, how I answer this question, who am I, no longer is what I do for a living, it's actually what I own or what I buy. So I referenced in, in the other lecture this study done by Christian Smith, who's a sociologist at Notre Dame, um, and it, it was young adults, and it was called Souls in, Souls in Transition. And he asked, you can imagine in this sample, he found an incredible amount of diversity amongst these young adults that he interviewed on religious affiliation, on understanding of certain ethical questions. And they asked these young adults all these questions. And then you can imagine there's an, an, a crazy amount of diversity across the sample. Except they found a couple things that were really congruent, that all young adults, to those who hated the church, to those that went three times a week, they found congruence with. And one of them was this ethical question they asked these young adults, again, 18 to 35 year olds. They said, is it ever wrong? Is there ever a moral time where it is wrong to buy something? Is there ever a time it's wrong, where it, where it is morally wrong to buy something? Overwhelmingly, at, this, at least in this sample, that all these young adults said, no. No, it's never wrong. They were willing to allow this caveat that if you can't pay for your daughter's diapers, then you probably should buy it. But they all said if you can afford it, it's never wrong to buy anything. And I think we've seen this kind of evolution. And I no longer, I don't want to define myself by what I do, but actually what I own. And I don't know what he does, but he's got a Mac car. He lives in that neighborhood. That, it, that as a very identity marker, that becomes more central. Now I have a cousin who's three years older than me, and we grew up in the same community. And um, so whenever we get together, we often talk about who have you run into, who have you seen, 
And now, you know, this is a Facebook world, so you can never get away from this stuff, you know. I don't know about you, but I just feel like I get friend requests from these people. I think, I hated you in high school, and now we have to be friends on Facebook. Like, why does this happen? It's like torture. It's like, now I hated you then, and now I have to see pictures of your kitten. I don't care about this. You know, leave me alone. But so we'll often talk about who have you seen, who have you run into, who have you talked to. And a number of times, three or four times, he's gone on this rant where he says that he'll have met somebody, an old friend, or he'll see, meet somebody new at a bar or something, and the person will have the audacity to ask him, so what do you do for a living? And he'll go crazy. He'll say, I don't know, why do people do that? Why do people ask me what I do for a living? I'm so much more than my job. Why do they care? Why do they care what I do? Why do they care what I do? Now, he doesn't ask anything to be ashamed of. I mean, he's not a pimp, you know what I mean? He's a, he sells insurance. Except maybe... I don't care. I don't care. But he has nothing to be ashamed of, but he hates it. He absolutely, 100% hates when people ask him what he does for a living. But he never fails to want to talk about the new flat screen TV, but the new addition they're putting on their house, the new cheap chair he wants to get. So again, I think consumption becomes more of a building block that we use to construct our identities than the very things we do. So it's like it's our identities are built not on our vocation, but often on our possessions. Now maybe another anecdotal point. I have Comcast. And if you have cable now or satellite, you know that there's a beautiful on-demand button. So, you know, you already have 300 stations, but you also need to have all these recorded ones. I feel like I need it. I watch far too much TV. But I feel like it raised me, so I feel like I owe it six hours a night. You know what I mean? Um, you know, you would you hang out with your aunt if she raised you. You would call her. I just feel like I have to kiss my TV before we go to bed. But that's a whole other issue that I have to say. But it, the interesting thing is On Demand on HBO, which I'm a big HBO fan, and uh, there was an old mini-series done by Tom Hanks called The Earth to the Moon. It was all about the Apollo moon missions in the early 1960s. Now, I was a kid raised in the 80s and early 90s, and so I didn't know anything about the Apollo moon missions, and I was probably high on ding-dongs or something during the social studies um, time that we learned about this. I, mean, I didn't hear any of this stuff. So I was watching this, and I was amazed. And the thing that I was amazed at was how these astronauts the incredible vocational depth these people have. I mean, they had, all of them were, for the most part, war heroes. They had to be incredible mathematicians to get into the program. Many of them were, you know, um, athletes, star athletes. And because of this incredible deep vocational depth, they were celebrities in the culture. They actually were on late night talk shows and sold orange juice. Now think of that evolution from 1960s and these incredibly deep vocational people all the way up 40 years to the early 2000s and Paris Hilton. Now what does Paris Hilton do? Well, we know she does coke. I mean, we know that much. <laughs> but what does she actually do? She can't sing. For God's sake, she cannot sing. Um, she doesn't do anything, but she buys stuff. And if you watch TMZ, they'll say, and Paris has returned from Europe with four trunkfuls of the new European styles this year. But what she does is actually buy something, and that becomes the very measure of her celebrity, um, is that she actually buys these things. So we become, I'm the kind of person who lives in this house. I'm the kind of person who drives that. I don't know what he does, but it got him that. That becomes a very marker for identity. I don't know if anyone's seen Richard Florida's work. Has anyone heard the name Richard Florida? He's a soci sociologist, demographer, and he's written this book called The Rise of the Creative Class. And he actually thinks there's been this kind of evolution in the class structure in America. And he kind of showed with his own study that there's this new class called the creatives, these people who um, are writing copy and, and uh, ad agencies who are designing websites, things like that. Um, and it's a really interesting, there's, there's, there's an interesting study there because I think that the creatives tend not to go to church. But um, that's just anecdotal. Uh, but they just kind of feel like, why would I go to church and sit on my hands when all day I create stuff? And then I go to church and I'm just a spectator with it. The interesting thing is, in studies, you said, you know, when I'm on airplanes now, I've noticed that the question you used to ask your seatmate when you would try to get to know them is it used to be, so what do you do for a living? So that's not the question people ask anymore. The question people now ask is, where do you live? Which, of course, fits his thesis on um, how cities have changed by having these creatives. But it also connects, I think, to this idea of consumption. Where I live quickly is what kind of car do I drive, what neighborhood do I live in, which becomes much more of a definer than, than much else. And there's an advantage to this. I mean, all I need to do really is stop by the Apple store or stop by the Gap, and I can feel like a new person. I, all I have to do is change my consumer patterns, and I can actually feel like a new person. So the whole makeover phenomenon, which you know used to be really hot, and still if you watch TLC, that's just a makeover channel on, on your cable dial. But the most interesting thing about the makeover phenomenon, especially the personal makeover, 
If you've ever watched one of these shows, they always end the same way, with the camera in the person's face, and they're asked to articulate what this experience has been like. And every time these people use evangelical language, the camera's in their face, and they say, what's this experience been like? And they say, I just feel like a completely different person. I just feel like a completely new person. I feel born again, they'll say. Now, what's happened? They've got their teeth whitened, they got a new haircut, and they have a new closet full of clothes. But it becomes the very mark of feeling like a completely different person. So I use, my, I use what I buy to define myself. And now, of course, with easy credit, I mean, I can go pretty far with buying without having any money. All I need is my credit card. And I can go pretty far without having any money. And we did a, um, we just finished our basement a couple of years ago. And it all started because I think I had watched too many episodes of this old house. <laughs> I was like, hey, I can do this. Tom Silva has got nothing on me. So I went down to the basement and I started to put up the walls and um, frame them out and insulate them because I live in a godforsakenly cold place. And about the whole idea of finishing our basement that was going to be a playroom for my kids. That was the whole idea of this thing. That we would throw all the kids' toys down there and I'd get a block and we'd lure them down there with candy <laughs> and I'd lock the door and my wife and I would pour ourselves wine and life would be perfect. So that was the whole plan, playroom for our kids. Well, about halfway through, and it had to be from God because I swear I heard the angels sing. I was putting up this wall and it just hit me. And I heard, ah, and I thought, a flat screen TV would go perfect right there. And it, the project quickly changed from, you know, playroom for my kids to home theater for my wife and I. And then for the next six months, my kids were not even allowed downstairs. Like, you keep your grubby fingers away from daddy's TV. <laughs> well, I did that after the project was done. I did that exhilarating and gross drive to Best Buy and loaded up my car with all the needed essentials for my home theater, flat screen TV, Blu-ray player, surround sound system. And the amazing thing is, I got halfway home with my car filled with this stuff, and I realized I didn't pay for this. And I didn't steal it, which would probably have been very smart. But, you know, I didn't pay, I for sure didn't pay in cash, I didn't write a check, and I didn't give them one of my own credit cards. What I essentially did is sign my name on some Best Buy papers, and I opened up a Best Buy credit card. But I had 18 months, no interest, no payment. You can go a pretty long way with buying stuff without having any money at all. And it's actually become kind of a national debate. Where's the place where you can find credit card applications everywhere. College campuses. It's become a national debate because we're sending young people out of, out of college with student loan debt, but also fifteen to $20,000 of credit card debt. And so you can, you, know, you can register for Bio 101, sign up for the Ultimate Frisbee class, and open a Visa Gold card all within the same quad area. You know? Now you think about this as an identity marker, and I think this happens in our churches often where we have these parents and we think they're really invested and they're really great parents and they're really wise and then we go on a retreat and the 13-year-old girl pulls out her credit card and says, oh yeah, my, we said, where did you get that credit card? Oh, my, my parents gave it to me. It's got like a $3,000 credit card on it. And you think, how could these parents do this? How could these parents um, allow their kids to, to have this credit card? Well, if this is about identity, you understand why. I mean, hear me saying this tongue-in-cheek, but it would be cruel. It would be actually... Really, I mean, it would be almost abusive to not allow your kid to get it when it's available. I mean, this is about identity, and she can't get the iPhone 4 now. What's it going to mean? I mean, it's not going to mean anything six months from now. It's going to have no kind of residue for her to define herself by, so she's got to have it now. So, you know, if you actually had to make the money, if you actually had to have the money in the bank before you could buy it, it wouldn't mean anything. So, of course, you need to have 19-year-olds with credit cards so they can go and buy this stuff now, because if they actually had the money... Well, it, 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 has, it has no electrical impulse to, to, to help them define themselves. If, if the 13-year-old can't go get the new shoes now, I mean, what, what value does it have? And so you can see why even good parents, I don't think they know this explicitly, but tacitly they kind of feel like, well, if I don't do it, I kind of feel like I'm hurting my kid. Like I'm not giving her what she needs. Now hear me say this tongue-in-cheek, but you can kind of understand why parents fall into this trap and you need to get their kids something. Because so I think it, in, a, in many ways it has a ton to do with their very identities. So I can go a long way in this kind of unreal reality of buying without having any money really at all. So we've seen this transition from work to consumption. I think we've also seen a transition from love to intimacy. Now let me define these words because I think you can define them in multiple different ways. And by intimacy, I'm actually following again Anthony Giddens, who's written this great book called The Transformation of Intimacy. And what, it, what Giddens actually means by love is he means love is this constant commitment over time. For instance, um, my wife's 
grandparents are known for having hated each other for years. I mean, you know, they just like yelled at each other forever. And at one point, the story goes that they were confronted. Um, the, the grandmother was confronted, and, and um, the aunt said, um, "Mom, you dad is clearly driving you crazy." She said, yeah, that, that SOB. I can't stand being with him. She said, "Well, mom, why are you still with her? Why are you still with him?" And she looked at her and said, "What? What is this?" I love him. That's why I love him. He drives me absolutely crazy. I want to strangle him, but I love him. I mean, in the sense of this constant commitment over time. And by intimacy, I mean these electric feelings of closeness. These kind of electric feelings of closeness. Maybe the best example of this, maybe, um, is the whole Twilight phenomenon. And I won't make you raise your hand if you're really into Twilight. Uh, I won't make you um, out yourself that way. But uh, if you know Twilight, these books about Bella who finds herself in a love triangle between... Edward and Jacob. Thank you. I was trying to... <laughs> I was pausing to cover my tracks, but th- thank you very much. <laughs> so she's, in this, she's in this love triangle between a vampire and a werewolf. Um, now, you think about this just within a plausibility structure. In the sense of... <laughs> yeah, are, are you right? Sorry, man. Uh, <laughs> okay, so you think about this whole drama within the context of a plausibility structure. So, for instance, social theorists tell us that people tend to take actions that they plausibly imagine that they would do. Within a strict plausibility structure, who really, I mean, honestly, who really wants to marry a vampire? You know what I mean? Like, do you want to raise kids with a vampire? Do you want to take your baby home um, and have a vampire rocking your child? late at night while you're sleeping and its fangs come out. I mean, no one really wants to marry a vampire or a werewolf. But, in the very logic of the intimate, ooh, a vampire, he's intriguing because he's dark and he's brooding. And there's these kind of, these feelings that you're drawn toward. So, I think Twilight, in many ways, plays very into this very logic of the intimate. Now, the interesting thing about that series, those movies, is they knew that they were going to make money for um, the studio because they knew high school girls would go, that high school girls would read the book, and they knew high school girls would go. But they jumped from successful to hand-over-fist moneymakers for the studio because not only did high school girls go, but middle-aged women went and loved them. But they all play with kind of in this cadence of the intimate. So we still have love. I mean, we still have romantic comedies and pop songs. Um, but it's not love, it's this constant commitment over time, but again, these intimate feelings of closeness. Um, so I have to confess this to you guys, and I hope some, some of you feel my pain on this, but here's my confession. I have watched every episode that's ever run of the real world on MTV. So, so you have no compassion for me, do you? You're like, oh, this poor guy. We're still watching it now, and my wife and I were watching, and we're looking at each other like, why are we watching this stupid show? If you don't know the show, it's about seven strangers sick to live in a house. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's an MTV reality show, maybe the first, actually the first reality show that ever existed, and it's essentially about seven young adults who live together, and now all the plot lines are the same, which is they get drunk and have sex together, and that's pretty much the only thing that happens. But we have watched every episode that's ever run. But a couple of seasons ago, and they're always in some American city, or actually sometimes not in an American city, but they're always in some city, and uh, they were in Washington, D.C. in this season. And, uh, what's that? Is that right? So they're in D.C. right next to his house. Yeah. <laughs> that was the greatest thing of your life. Yes. Uh, wow, that's great. All right, so a block away from his house, they had this season, and it was a GC, and there was a guy, and this is a common thing that happens in the real world, is that someone comes with a significant relationship. And of course, they're on this show where there's free booze and everything, and the relationship falls apart, which is always a shocker. Every season, it's a shock that this thing is going to fall apart. So this one young adult named Trey, he had a significant relationship. He comes onto the show, and clearly, it's not working out so well. So he's talking to one of the other young women and they're kind of commiserating or he's commiserating with her about how difficult this relationship has been. And a young woman looks at him and says these words. She says, you know what, Trace? You know what I think? I think if it's hard, it just shows you it's not meant to be. If it's hard, it just shows you it's not meant to be. Now, if you have had a significant partner for like more than three minutes, you know, it's just hard. That's all it is. It's just, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, but it is hard. Uh, but that is the very logic of intimacy. Intimacy is never hard. 
You see that person from across the room in your heartbeat and you can't take your hands off of them. You can't help but want to be near them. I mean, intimacy is what you see at the movie theater with 15-year-old kids. So you're like, my gosh, this is disgusting. Take your tongues out of each other's mouths and move away from each other. But they can't. Uh, so th- this intimate, in many ways, I think starts to set the definition. I mean, how many times have we heard people say things like, well, it's not that I don't love him anymore. There's just not anything there. Or it's not that you know she isn't still really important to me and I don't really care for her. It's just that we became two different people. In other words, my identity is more held back than allowed to kind of prosper and grow being in this relationship. So I'm out of it. So when this happens, just think about how this changes the church. I hate doing generational kind of analysis. I'm not much of a gen theory person. I think culture is much too difficult to say, well, because you were born in these years, you're like this, and because you were born in these years, you're like that. So having said that, though, I think there's something interesting to think about along these lines, about what this does to the church. For instance, I think we have a group of people, older people particularly, who really came of age constructing their identity around work and commitment. And another group of people, I'll include myself in this, came of age constructing their identities around consumption and intimacy. And then, therefore, you have a group of people who see the church as something you are committed to and you work at. And another group of people think the church is something that you consume and find intimacy with. Mm. And I think we, we potentially, in mainline Christianity, we have a perfect storm potentially brewing. And a perfect storm, maybe I'm being a little bit too dramatic about this, but the perfect storm is we're going to have these generations of people who have worked these institutions for good or for ill, and they're going to be gone. And people like me, I'm not doing what they did. In other words, you have these people who worked this thing. When the boiler broke, when the, it snowed on, set, on Saturday night, I mean, at my little church, we have a little church in South Minneapolis, my wife is the pastor of it, Magically, if it snows on Saturday night when we get to church on Sunday morning, those steps are shoveled. Who did it? Some 80-year-old guy did it. Or some you know, the 75-year-old um, woman got there and shoveled those steps. And even I don't even think about it. But when I do think about it, you know what I think? I ain't doing it. I am not doing it. And somewhat for good reason. I'd rather give my daughter a bath and get up to church and do that. But I don't know what we're going to do when these people are gone and people like me refuse to do that. And we have all these buildings. And what I tend to think is, well, you know, let's pay someone to do it. Well, that works out pretty well until we realize we don't have any money. And one of the other really interesting things about Smith's study is he found that actually these young adults, they don't give much money. Even over and against some of the media reports of the Obama generation, that these were really invested, really involved, that actually, statistically, they don't give much money. And why would you? First of all, you don't have a long-term job that gives you any financial security. And you don't know when. I mean, you don't know when the iPhone 5 is coming out. You know, it could be out. They tell us it could be out in March. It could be out in May. It could be out in September. you got to, you know, how can you feel like you have any money to give when you don't know when that's going to come out? And the iPad 3 is coming out very soon, too. I mean, you know, this is the great thing about Apple is they, as soon as you stop longing for what you have, they give you something else to long for. But, so this becomes, I think, a real issue for the church. And I don't know if you've ever had conversations with some of these older people in your church, but you know, they didn't stay in these churches because they liked it, because they felt connected to it. I mean, I, you've had experiences maybe before where you know, the church decides to change hymnals or, or something, and it just pisses you know, 78-year-old Jake off. I mean, he is angry. And you kind of know Jake, so you see him in the hallway, and you think, Jake, you're mad, aren't you? Oh, I am so mad. I could scream. I am so mad. And then you say, well, Jake, are you going to leave the church? And he says, oh, honey. I've been mad at this church for 35 years. You know? I'm not leaving anywhere. Uh, but for most, most people, and I'm sure I'm over-asserting this, and this is a little hyperbolic, but for people, my, I just feel like, you know what? I don't like it. I just find another church. If, it, if it's not meeting my needs, I just go find another church to consume. And actually, the churches that tend to be doing the best, however you define that, by growth or by money or whatever, tend to be those that feel like places you can consume and find intimacy with. And I think we run into a challenge here um, with younger generations of people when um, we have these buildings and we don't necessarily have the will to manage them. Now, why the change, actually? Why this transition from work to consumption, from love to intimacy? Now, without just sounding like we're going like sci-fi weird, but I think it does have a, have a, huge, a huge amount to do with our experience of time and space. The time and space is not necessarily what it used to be. Now, I don't know if anyone has a DVR, which I love my DVR almost more than anything. And I had a TiVo very early on, 
and I love my steamboat. But it's amazing to think about how this technology changes the way we experience time and space. So I had my steamboat very early on, even when I was in seminary, which seemed ironic, but I felt like I needed it for research purposes. <laughs> um, but I noticed really quickly after just weeks of having my DVR, you know, on your DVR, like you can, the great thing is you could start a show. Like we were really into Lost for a while. Did anyone else get into Lost? Yeah. So we would get into Lost, but we'd always we needed to watch it right away. But we'd always wait about 19 minutes into the show because then you could start watching it and fast forward to the commercials before you would ever catch up to any of the commercials and have to watch them. So you could start right at 19 minutes. And the most interesting thing is that when you fast forward through, the way that the kind of cursor and the time bar works is that you actually are kind of catching up the time. And you're kind of catching up, and that's when you say, oh, well, we better slow down here, pause it for a little bit, or else we're going to catch up to it. We're going to catch up with time, which is really trippy, because that's kind of what the show is about, too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we could talk about that over some, some alcohol. That would be fun. Uh, but, but I noticed after having my, my TiVo for a couple of weeks that I started to want to use that practice in my day-to-day -day life. You know what I mean? Like I would be in the line at the DMV and I'd notice my fast forward thumb <laughs> starting to trigger. Like how come I can't just fast forward this? Some of you are back there like fast forward to the point, idiot. Come on, you want to fast forward fast forward to this piece right now. Um, but our experience of time and space is, is we experience it in a different way often through our technology. Now one of the most interesting things about youth ministry, I think, is that youth ministry has tended, well let me say it this way, that it appears, at least anecdotally to a lot of youth workers, that it's actually easier to get kids to sign up to go on mission trips than it is to get them to sign up to be part of a Bible study. All right, that makes some sense, actually. You know, I mean, it sounds a little bit more exciting. But what's more interesting is it's easier to get them to sign up to go on a mission trip than it is to go across town to Six Flags or some other amusement park. That youth workers are actually finding now that they can get kids to sign up to go to Monterey, Mexico, but can't get them to sign up to go across town to Six Flags. And you wonder why that is. And one of the reasons I think that is is because youth ministry has always followed this kind of cultural progression. And for instance, a couple of generations ago, the big youth ministry thing to do was the camp. And you could see how that would play and become incredibly relevant to a group of young people where you were basically saying to them, hey, instead of having to work for the land, how about you go and enjoy the land? And that sounds like Oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. I'll do that. Or to kind of a baby boomer generation, you, you could say, let's go to the big youth ministry conference. And it was like a nascent MTV generation. So you could hear a, rock, a Christian rock band that, was, that wasn't quite lame yet. It's gotten really lame now. Uh, but you know, that was really appealing. But the thing I think is so appealing, one of the reasons that it's easier to get young people to actually go on a mission trip than it is anywhere else, is because you actually invite them to live into the state of their being, which is to be movers. And Zygmunt Baumann says, we are all now movers. We're moving all the time. And actually, ironically, since you have no technology in this area, you have to be, actually be here. In most rooms, in my own classroom, computer screens are up, and I am not naive enough to know that when my students are in the room, they're also not somewhere else. And one of the most existential issues for me teaching is when I'm talking and I look at a student and I'm not saying anything funny and he has this wry smile on his face and I'm thinking, what, my zipper's down? And I'm afraid he's taking a picture and it's like everywhere. Um, but of course, he's here but he's not here. He's moving all the time. And I think through our technology, through our cell phones, through our computers, that we're in this constant state of moving. And to actually say to a young person, you want to go on a mission trip into the Caribbean? And that actually sounds pretty cool because I get to leave my parents who I hate for a couple of weeks or for a week. That sounds great. But it also moves into the state of their being. So we're always in this constant state of movement, I think. And so time and space isn't what it used to be. And consumption and intimacy play into this in the sense that consumption and intimacy are not having a sense of time possessive. Consumption and intimacy take very little time. Just the slide of a credit card or the look from across the room and you're in the land of new identity. And consumption and intimacy aren't very dependent on space. Um, con consumption can be done anywhere. Intimacy only needs a by-the-hour hotel room and you can be in this land of new identity. My son, um, it was just a, in September, was his seventh uh, birthday. And so... It was a very weird, backward thing, but one of the things he wanted for his birthday, he got really into Angry Birds, you know, the iPhone game. Um, and so he wanted for his birthday a Angry Birds setup, which is just basically the board game version of the video game, which in my day, you know, it went board game to video game, not the reverse. But now we're in a world where it goes from the, from the video game to the board game. So he wanted this, he got this Angry Birds setup, we bought it for him. 
And so uh, he had about $50 left over from his grandparents and stuff, and it was a Saturday afternoon. So I said to him, Owen, oh, you know, I'm willing to drive you somewhere if you want to get another birthday present with your money. He said, yeah. So well, what do you think you want to get? Where should we go? He says, well, where did your mommy get that Angry Bird set up? Thinking that he might want to get another one. I said, oh, well, we got that on Amazon. He said, well, let's go to Amazon. I said, well, um, you can't really go to Amazon, you know. He said, well, I, I know. I, I said, oh, really? I said, yeah, you can't really go to Amazon. He said, well, where is it? I said, well, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, you, you just, you know, you can't go there. He said, I know, I know you can't go there. I, I get that. But where is it? Like, where is it in the world? I, I, I don't know. I, you go on your computer and it magically shows up at your door. That's all I know. He's like, no, 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 no. But where in the world is Amazon? I don't know. I mean, you know where it is. It's some warehouse somewhere and it's, their headquarters are in Seattle. But they don't really exist in a space necessarily. You go on your computer, and they show up. They show up there. So consumption and intimacy really has this value of you can do it wherever you want. Now, of course, there's a downside to this. And the downside of it is, and maybe this fits into the very rhetoric we often use, in the very fact in our cultural context that we are absolutely scared to death of our identity being stolen, actually shows that maybe our identities are very thin. So while consumption and intimacy do allow us to quickly change our identities, the truth of the matter is they're not really built on much. They're not really constructed on much. And on all the fluidity and all the change, um, when it fails, when your consumer good fails you or your intimate relationship goes dead, belly up, you can actually feel like you don't know who you are. Like you don't, where do I stand? What do, what do I live for? What's the point of my life? And this is the real danger, I think, of consumption and intimacy. Or maybe I'll say it this way. I'll, I'll admit it. Consumption actually works for me. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but you buy something new and you wake up in the morning and you're like, hey, wait, something is good. What is it? Oh, yeah, i got a new laptop. That's what's good. I mean, it actually works really well. The only problem with it is it has a very short shelf life. Now, I don't know, on the East Coast or wherever you're from, did you guys ever hear about or know about um, this, this gum that was called Lucky Stripe with a zebra on it? You remember this gum? And it was like zebra stripes on a stick of gum. Gum. Now, when I was a kid, what would happen is my mom would take me to the grocery store, and I would get to have a pack of this gum. And the whole idea is I could choose as much of it as I wanted as long as I stayed in line and kept my mouth shut as she did the grocery shopping. Now, if you've ever had this gum, you know two things about it. First of all, it is the most delicious, wonderful gum you could ever have. When you stick a piece in your mouth, your taste buds explode with fr- fruity deliciousness. I mean, it's stuff is, oh, it's, it's wonderful, except there's one tragic flaw, deeply tragic flaw. That literally lasts four seconds. I'm not kidding. Like one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand. It's dead. I mean, it is dead. Now, I, like I said, I would go to my, I'd go to grocery shopping with my mom, and I was a genius child, so she would give me this gum and say, "You can have as much of it as you want." So, as a genius I was, I would chew a piece. It would go dead with flavor. Instead of spitting that piece out, I would baptize the old piece with the new flavor. So we'd get to the checkout aisle. I have. 40, 50 empty cartridges of gum and a mouthful of tasteless gum. But it's a great analogy for how consumption works. That it actually really works. It's really tasty. It tastes good. The problem is, it only lasts so long. But that's okay. Because that all, be, all that means is you got to go back to the mall and get something new. But you can quickly see how this becomes a habitual, obsessive, compulsive thing. And it's no wonder that culturally we have a new uptick of people who have a certain addiction called being shopaholics. Or, connected to intimacy, we also have a new rise of, a, of, of addiction called being a sexaholic. And we actually have in our culture um, someone with, or used to have, a billion dollars in the bank in a now less than a perfect golf swing, but it used to be a perfect golf swing, who came out and said that he was a sexaholic, Tiger Woods. And you think about the Tiger Woods phenomenon, which actually would be a very good dissertation someone could write on um, culturally what happened with the Tiger Woods phenomenon, because there's a lot of issues going on um, there with sport itself, with race. But one of the things that, reasons I think Tiger got so severely thrown under the bus and is still, to this day, fodder for late-night jokes, and this is, a, this is chauvinistic, but I think it fits within our culture, is one of the reasons Tiger got so severely thrown under the bus was because he was married to a Swedish swimsuit model. Now, again, this is chauvinistic, but one of the things that exists in the culture is that there's nothing, the epic of beauty is the Swedish swimsuit model. And what happened when when this all broke was that pictures of these women that Tiger had cheated on with were showing up 
um, on TMZ and other places, and they were waitresses from the IHOP and the Bellagio, and they were nowhere near as beautiful as his wife. So it became fodder, chauvinistic fodder, for everyone to say, how, how the hell could he cheat on his wife? If I was married to a Swedish swim swim model, I wouldn't cheat on her. Tigers are so stupid. How can he do this? Look at these, these women are nowhere near as beautiful as his wife. Well, what it plays into, I think, is this whole way that intimacy works. That our relationships have to be built on something other than just the electric feelings of closeness. Because even if you marry a Swedish swimsuit model, there's got to be something more to the relationship than just these electric feelings of closeness because they, just like consumption, dissipate. And Tiger was told he could have whatever he wanted. He had enough money to have whatever he wanted. And he ended up cheating on his wife for, with, with other people to get that intimate encounter. So the problem with consumption and intimacy as an identity marker is that it easily and quickly can fail us. And then we're thrust into kind of a form of nothingness. Like, what is the point of my existence? What's the point of my life? How do I even understand myself? You had your hand up. Do you want to jump in? Or have I blown past your point? Uh, you did. Actually, I have a, a question about the church. And you were saying that yeah. we need to find commitment in the church. But I wasn't clear what intimacy in the church would like. Yeah, I mean, it, here's the deal. I mean, to, to contrast those things, I think, is in some sense, I'm helpful. I don't know if there is actually a way forward in that, and I'm going to try to turn us in, into that direction. Um, but what I'm contrasting off is you have this group of people who really saw the church as something you were committed to. And I think sometimes, especially people who work with young people, it can backlash on us. Like where you say to people, hey, will you help out with DBS this year? And they say, I already did that. In other words, I did that commitment. I've met what I'm supposed to, so find someone else to do it. But it does kind of play within this logic where a lot of times if you ask me, do you want to help without DBS? I would say, I don't want to do that. Like I don't feel any responsibility to have to do that. I just, it's not how I want to spend my time. I don't want to do that. I would rather do other things. And so I think, again, I'm not trying to say one is better than the other, except for the fact that we do have these buildings we're going to inherit. And I'm not going to spend my Sunday afternoon um, painting them. And I think that becomes a real issue. That I even, I mean, I'm saying this for myself and throwing myself under the bus here a little bit, but I, I, you know, I don't see it as my responsibility to keep these institutions afloat. Well, that's going to be a problem when we inherit all of these buildings and we either don't have the money to hire someone to do it or we don't have the will to do it. Um, so contrasting intimacy and consumption that way in the sense that I want to just go to a place where I can consume it instead of being committed to it. And, you know, I mean, we can all throw mega churches under the bus, but the one thing that they do provide is services and consumptive opportunities for, for their people. Um, and they can even sometimes feel like a mall when you go inside them. Yeah. Oh, is that, I think Lucky Strike was a, a cigarette. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's another addiction that I was referring to. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a really, it's, it's a great question because this is the deal. I mean, I've confessed my own consumptive TV watching since you. And, um, you know, no one's taking away my cable. I'm not, I'm not doing it, you know. I'm, it, I, I'm, I'm not taking it away. So what do you do? You know, how, how do you think about this? Well, one of the ways to respond, and youth ministry has tended to respond this way, is actually to make discipleship play in the cadence of consumption and intimacy. So think about this. I mean, I go to a lot of these big youth ministry events, and you walk through, especially some of these big national events, and you walk through um, the exhibit hall, which I tend to call the exhibition hall, and um, the amount of stuff you can buy for your kid to consume to follow Jesus is amazing. T-shirts, Bible covers, Bibles that look like magazines, magazines that look like Bibles. I mean, you can buy all of this stuff. So one approach is actually to 
make it take on the form of consumption. And then you think about intimacy too. I mean, I have quote-unquote non-Christian friends or friends who you know don't want anything to do with the church, and they'll often say, you know what's weird about some of those churches? And they'll call them karaoke churches. You know, the ones with the words on the screen. They're like, that's weird. That's like karaoke. They go to church and you have karaoke songs. But the other thing that they'll often say is things like, well, I, yeah, I kind of like the music, but it's so weird. It's kind of like Jesus is my boyfriend music. Um, and, you know, hear me. I, I kind of like that stuff. It, it plays into the way I was raised. I, I kind of like it. But it does really play with kind of this intimacy thing. And I think one of the ways forward in youth ministry has often been, well, just make discipleship about consumption and intimacy. I mean, they would never say it that boldly, but that's the way it, it functions. And I actually don't think that's very helpful at all. So one of the ways I want to kind of take this turn is um, to actually, maybe it's helpful to think of the story of Jacob in the biblical text. Now, this probably isn't the best exegesis, but it preaches so tough. Um, <laughs> but you know, you have the story of Jacob, who Jacob, is, as a good Hebrew, is, is, his name is his identity. And Jacob needs the heel. And he's known as a heel because he comes in the world holding his bigger, hairier brother's heel. But then he lives into the name, and he becomes a con man. You know, he cons his brother out of his birthright, and as any good con man, he makes a lot of money for himself conning other people. I mean, he is Sawyer and Lost. This is my second Lost reference, if anyone's keeping track. Uh, But he's a con man. You know, he can do a long con, he can do a short con, but he's made a lot of money for himself. But of course, unfortunately, the day of reckoning comes where his big, hairy brother is going to... um, get him back, or so Jacob assumes. And so it comes the time of encounter, and they're going to meet each other on the horizon, and Jacob comes and takes all of his cattle, and he sends them to his brother. Essentially, in that cultural context, he's giving him suitcases and suitcases filled with cash. He's like, don't kill me. You know, you can take this stuff. You can buy stuff with this. Take my money and, you know, have a good time. Throw a party for yourself. You know, buy a new car. You can take the stuff and do what you want. Well, it doesn't work very well. So he then, the real stand-up guy that Jacob is, he takes his wives and his children and sends them off to his brother Esau. He, he imagines this guy is on murder, you know, he's at a murderous rage to get him. And so what he's essentially saying is, um, you know, they're my wives. Wink, wink. Take them. Don't kill me. You, you can have them. You can be intimate with them. Now that doesn't work. I mean, look at my seven-year-old. Look at how cute she is. You can't kill me. Look at my seven-year-old. How could you, you know, how could you kill me? doesn't really work either. And now, of course, Jacob is left all alone and the angel of the Lord shows up and they start wrestling and wrestling and wrestling, which is fairly phenomenal because it's out of character for Jacob. I mean, he's more of a runner than he is a fighter, but nevertheless, they, here they are, wrestling and wrestling and wrestling all the way to daybreak. And at daybreak, finally, this angel of the Lord has to get out of it, so he touches Jacob's hip, knocks it out of socket. But still, Jacob will not let him go and demands that he bless him. So the angel of the Lord says, well, what is your name? Essentially, what is your identity? Who are you? Jacob confesses. I'm Jacob. I'm a heel. Do you have $3? I'll take five. I mean, you know, that's just who I am. The angel of the Lord says, no. No, you are no longer Jacob. You are Israel, the one who actually wrestles with God, the one who wrestles with God. And I think a way to think about identity in youth ministry and with young adults is to recognize that we all swim in this water of consumption and intimacy. But part of the issue is it's going to fail us. It's going to leave us with deep questions, with deep doubt, with deep fear. And I think where the church has actually failed this generation of people is that when, they are, when it is time for them to wrestle, when they are yearning for a community to wrestle with them, we don't seem like we're a community that wants to do it. That we don't feel like we're a community that actually wants to be there and to wrestle with them. And I think one of the ways forward for the church as we do ministry with younger generations of people, is not to make our sermons like sitcoms. is not to make our worship experience, experiences like U2 concerts. It's actually to become people who really wrestle with God, who really wrestle with our fear, who really wrestle with these deep questions and become a place where we bravely do that. And this happens so often in youth ministry, and we often tend to see it as a problem. I remember in my young life days when we would take kids to camp, one year, I took this big, burly hockey player. I was in Minnesota at the time. So this big, burly ninth grade hockey player. I already played a year of varsity, which was something you, you, know, you don't do when you're in Minnesota. You have to be a junior or senior to play. But he was a you know, big 6'3 kid. And I was really happy that I had got this kid. I thought, oh, now he's going to come. He's going to hear the gospel. It's going to be so significant. First night of what they call club, which is where the kids got to hear the gospel and hear some music and see a skit. Um, but most importantly, um, hear the biblical story. Um, about halfway through the night, I look over at this kid and he's crying. And I think, 
We got him. We got him. You know, he's crying. I'm thinking, we got him. And then I'm already thinking, like, how will I give my speech as Youth Worker of the Year? You know? Um, and so, so I wait until the whole kind of area empties out. And he's still sitting in the corner with his, with his hands in his head and he's crying. I'm waiting. And I ask him, so uh, Adam, you want to go for a walk? He's like, yeah. And I'm already thinking, you know, we're going to pray together. And this will be it. You know, someday he will be a missionary. And he'll say, it all started when my youth pastor, you know, that's what I imagine. So I'm walking with him, and he's still crying. I said, pretty upset. I, and then the tears really start coming. Yeah. I said, well, what is it? You know, tell me about it. I think he's going to say, I never understood the gospel before. And it just, I just feel like, you know, that's what I imagine he's saying. So he starts off, and he stops, and just ready for his words, and he says, it's just, it's just, she doesn't know I exist. And I'm like, you stupid idiot. Like, we are talking about eternal things, and you're upset because this girl doesn't like you? And so there's this girl that he had a crush on since he was in, you know, sixth or seventh grade. And I remember now I could, you know, it was like a movie scene. Now I could see flashbacks to on the bus ride up as he was flirting with her, and she was, you know, turning him down all the time. Uh, and so my response was, you idiot. Like, we are talking about important things here, and all you care about is this girl that you're, you're, uh, you want to date. Now, shock of all shock, I actually think I did very bad ministry that day. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, idiot. Um, but yeah, I mean, here's this kid who has his own deep issue of feeling rejected, of feeling nothingness and pain. And this was the point to be with him, to share in his life, to wrestle with him, to seek for God in the midst of it. Instead, I was trying to get past this, trying to get beyond this. But I think it really is at these places of our deepest longing and deepest fear. And part of my assertion is I think young adults feel these experiences of who am I? Or what's the point of my life? Of these institutions that have failed, failed me, of my family that continues to be in transition. Where is God in the midst of this? So I told you at the beginning about this, um, my wife and I traveling around the world with this money. We actually found our way in Europe and started backpacking around Europe. And we were living on like $30 a day, which meant, um, you know, a local breakfast and a Big Mac at about three o'clock was not a way to live. Let me tell you. Um, but we were we had to take we were taking an overnight train from um, Venice to Nice, and you know we were living on very little money, so we had to share a sleeper car, overnight sleeper car. And it's kind of scary. I mean, I've seen enough horror movies around people backpacking around Europe to feel like these people are going to kill us in the middle of the night, you know? And they're sleeping with an arm's length away, and they're they're going to kill us. So we were anxiously waiting for who was going to come in. I mean, we were we were nervous. And luckily, what we thought was luckily, this young, attractive couple from Montreal comes in. Now, if you've ever backpacked around Europe, you know that there's a code of conversation. And the first thing you talk about is, where have you been? So we talk about where we've been. They talk about where they've been. Second thing you talk about is, where are you going? Now, they were going to Nice to use their French, but then they were headed to Barcelona because the wine was flowing, the clubs were hopping, and the weather was warm. We were, on the ner- we were the nerds in the theological tour. So we were headed north up to Geneva to see Calvin sites, then around the Lake of Lausanne to Basel to see Karl Barth's house, then to Nuremberg for the night before taking a bus into Flossenburg to see the concentration camp where Bonhoeffer was killed. And we weren't quite nerdy enough to reveal that all, but we're like, yeah, we're headed to Switzerland and <laughs> Germany. And they're like, you know, your rail pass will take you to Barcelona. And we're like, yeah, I know, but we're just kind of, yeah. Just, you know, completely ashamed nerds. But then the third thing comes up, which is the dangerous thing when you backpack, which is what do you do at home? So we launched into our new identity. Kyra was going to be a pastor. I was going to be a theologian. And the looks on their faces were priceless. Now they were convinced we were going to kill them in the middle. <laughs> their eyes got big, and they had nothing to say. And finally this young woman goes, oh, cool. You know, you can hear, like, I don't know how to, what to make of this, so I guess cool. And then she figures she's got to say something here because we're going to be together, you know, sleeping within arms with each other. So she says, oh, well, um, I went to confirmation when I was a kid. We're like, you are fine, child. We will not kill you in the middle of the night now. But then she says, yeah, you know, I went to confirmation when I was a kid. And I got kicked out of confirmation because I asked too many disturbing questions. Now, I'm the kind of person who thinks of the perfect thing to say about five minutes after it's appropriate. You know? So if you had an aerial view of me in a fight with my wife, it would be us resolving the conflict, and then me walking away and thinking, well, wait, now I know why you're wrong. Now I know why you're exactly <laughs> trying to reignite the fight, which never works very well. 
But in this moment, I thought of the perfect thing to say at the exact time. So she said, you know, I got kicked out of confirmation because I asked him a disturbing question. And I turned to her and said, well, I think that's too bad. Because I think the best theologians ask the most disturbing questions. And I think that's really true. I think the part of our problem with passing on faith to this generation of people is we haven't provided them a space to ask their disturbing questions. And part of the problem with youth ministry in general is that it's been this safe place with the whole point is to make kids good or to make kids morally upstanding that we're actually afraid to invite them to articulate their questions in this place. But maybe youth group, if such a thing exists in your church, is actually there to wrestle with our most disturbing questions. I actually tell my own students all the time that middle class parents should be scared to death to send their kids to youth group. And not because you're going to sign them up for some revolution, but because you're going to ask really deep questions. To really wrestle with it. Like, what is a lifetime and why do we live it? Who is this God? That it should be, it should be this real wrestling with these questions. So I told the, the, the pastors and youth pastors earlier that I think one of the reasons we need young people actually in our churches is not because they're the church of tomorrow. That's lame. And it's kind of, kind of patronizing, actually. Like, you are the church of tomorrow. And we don't really even need them because we want to be kind of moralistic and say, you are the church of today, just not quite mature enough or something. Um, <laughs> But I think actually the reason we need young people in our, in our churches is because we need their theological voice. Because they say things that shake us loose from the ruts we often get in. As if all church really is about is making sure that the energy bill is okay. Or making sure that, you know, what are we going to do with our parking problems. So I have this friend of mine who is a youth, uh, a youth pastor in, um, in Dallas. And uh, we've been in conversation a lot and he, he had actually done this retreat where he worked for weeks on constructing this teaching that he was going to do on the cross of Christ and the significance of the cross of Christ. So he went and did this middle school retreat, six to eighth graders. So he gets on the bus, and one of the little kids, one of the kids sits next to him, seventh graders sits next to him, and uh, he says, so how'd you like the retreat? I really liked it a lot, and I really liked your teaching. And my friend John's like, yes, yeah, I'm great. I did it. And he said, oh yeah? Well, what'd you like? He said, well, you know, actually, John, I was thinking, you know, all the things you said about Jesus and the cross and stuff, what I realized is all we really need to do is find a unicorn and drink its blood. And my friend thinks, that's it. I quit. I'm, done. I'm absolutely done. I'm never doing this again. I'm out of it. But here it is in many ways. Like, this is a crazy thing to say. Like, let's just find a unicorn and drink its blood. But it's a profoundly imaginative, beautiful thing. And this is the thing about, I think, youth ministry and our job is to advocate for their theological voice. Because they will say crazy things like, all we need to do is find a unicorn and drink its blood. But they also say, say things like, huh, putting in a new organ we're spending $6 million on, but we say we like feed the poor and stuff? Hmm. And what we often do is say, shut up, kid. You don't have any idea how this church functions. You don't have any idea. Shut up. You, we don't need to hear you. Go to the youth ministry. Go to the youth room and do your little thing there. We bought you a flat screen TV and a drum kit. Go and enjoy it and shut up. But we actually need them because we need their theological voice. We need them to say things like, we just got to find a unicorn and drink its blood. Um, there's problems with that one. He, he read too much Harry Potter is actually what, what, what happened there. Um, but I mean, it's a profoundly imaginative assertion. So I've already referenced Lost twice, so I'll tell you another Lost story, which is J.J. Abrams, who's the creator of this. If any of you have ever watched TED Talks, if people watch TED Talks online, which is these, you know, I don't know how long are they, 12 to 18 minutes or something, and they take the most imaginative, people are doing just innovative, imaginative things, and they invite them to come and talk for a few minutes on what they're doing. And it could be someone who's doing something in education, uh, it could be someone who's doing multiple different fields. So J.J. Abrams, this director, producer, gets invited to share. And if you've ever seen any of J.J. Abrams stuff, it's all incredibly imaginative and incredibly um, mysterious. And, you know, um, Lost was like that, Cloverfield, all the stuff that he's done is like that. So he's talking about why he does what he does. And he's saying even as a kid, he was fascinated with boxes and how they worked together and how they were glued. And he was just always into this mystery. And he says, you know what I realized early in my career as writing screenplays is I realized that it might just be that mystery is a better road to imagination than knowledge. That mystery is a better road to imagination than knowledge. I think in youth ministry, we have beat kids over the head with knowledge. That your point as a youth worker is to get them to know stuff, to get them to know this, to get them to know that. And I'm not saying all knowledge is bad. But the beauty of the Christian confession is the mystery of God's love for us. The mystery of God 
incarnating himself in the world of Jesus Christ. I mean, the mystery of, of the confession that bread and wine becomes the real presence of Jesus Christ. I mean, this is the mystery. And often, this is the beauty of ministry. It's the laboratory for the mystery, for the wrestling. And for the wrestling up against our deepest, darkest stories to find God in the midst of that. And I think that becomes our challenge up against where consumption and intimacy will fail. Where is God then? Where does God actually need us and encounter us? So, one more, maybe one or two more stories. Um, my, it's my job, I told people that my, it's my job and my family to, to put my son to sleep that night. Owen is now seven. And um, we made a terrible parenting mistake that we actually allowed Owen to watch HBO. I mean, there was a there was a marathon of the Sopranos on, and I thought, when will a six-year-old learn about the mob in America? You know, I mean, I just figured it had to happen. No, actually, what we allowed him to watch was this um, children's programming. It was these poems, these children's pro- programs, that, uh, poems that actually had been an- animated. And so he, he listened to this poem called, uh, a Ni- I Have a Nightmare in My Closet. So Owen became convinced he had a nightmare in his closet. So this night, and it's my job, like I said, to put him to bed. And once he's to bed, then I'm free to do important, important things in my life, which is to watch terrible TV shows, which is very important to me. So I was trying to get this kid to sleep this night, and he said, Daddy, I have a nightmare in my closet. So Owen, you don't have a nightmare in my closet. He said, yeah, Daddy, I know I have a nightmare in my closet. I said, well, Owen, you don't. He said, no, Daddy, I do. I said, well, what if I turn on a light, we'll look in your closet, and you'll see there's no nightmare. Yeah. So we open the closet, move some toys around. You see a nightmare? You see anything? No. All right, go back to bed. As soon as I talked to him, kissed him again, shut up the light, he screams, it's back. I know, the nightmare is back, it's there. So I'm thinking, how am I going to get this kid to bed? I mean, I've got to get this kid to sleep. So it becomes, I get this genius idea. I know what I'll do. I'll turn to my religion. So I turn to him and say, Owen, let's pray and ask Jesus to be here. So then you don't need to be afraid because Jesus will be with you. And he looked at me like this was the best news he had ever heard. He said, yes, let's do it. So I grabbed Owen's hands and I said, Jesus, Please be here right now with Owen. He's scared. He needs you to be with him. Please be present with him now so he doesn't need to be afraid. Amen. And now I'm thinking, best father of the year. And I'm like, I'm, I'm great. So I kiss him and I say, good night, Owen. I love you. And he says, wait, Dad. I said, what? Where's Jesus? And I said, well, Owen, we pray that Jesus is here. He says, I don't see Jesus. I said, yeah, I know. That's not how it works. But when you pray, you just pray. Said, yeah, right. And he said, he said, no, Daddy, I don't see Jesus. And I said, I know him, but when you pray, Jesus is here. He said, Daddy, I, I don't see Jesus. And then he gets to, and now I'm starting to doubt myself. You know, I'm like, no, this is how it works. When you pray, Jesus shows up. And I'm, you know, thinking of these theological debates. No, this is how it works. He's like, no, Daddy, I'm, I'm scared that I don't see Jesus. I'm saying, listen, kid. I have three advanced theological degrees. I know how this works. When you pray, Jesus shows up. He's like, he's, no. And finally, he just gets this look on his face, and he does the one tear that paints his cheek. And he looks at me with all the frustration and all the fear he could muster. And he said, Daddy, I am afraid, and Jesus is not here. And you wonder within our churches, especially with the young adults, who find consumption and intimacy failing them who feel rejection, and all we keep on saying, or the only thing they think the church offers is just this nice, fluffy language of, but Jesus is here. If you pray, Jesus will be here. And they keep on saying, I have a damn nightmare in my closet. It's a big nightmare in my closet. And we're saying, well, it's okay. Just pray about everything will be okay. That they're drowning, and we're just throwing them fluffy, um, fluffy platitudes as if, that will, as if that will help. And I think one of the ways forward for us is to become the brave people who really seek for God have a place and have a theological perspective that can find God in the midst of our nightmares. And it really is this question that my son was asking, which is, where is Jesus? Where is Jesus up against my deepest fear? And I think one of the places the church, and maybe even theology has failed us, kind of contextually on the ground, is we have not done well helping our pastors be able to articulate where it is that Jesus Christ encounters them. Now there's a, a bunch of different theological ways you could answer that question, where? We haven't done a good job actually practicing ministry out of this articulation of where it is that Jesus Christ finds us. Where it is that Jesus Christ encounters us. So where is it? So instead we drown people with platitudes so often in American Christianity. My last story and then we'll have a conversation. The great story about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor, theologian, who was killed in the last days of World War II and is often known as um, one of the martyrs of the 20th century. But the thing that we don't know much about Bonhoeffer is we don't know much about his past. 
And it would be very interesting to know. Um, we know a ton about his past, and since we have thousand word biographies of his past, we don't know much about what he thought about his past. We don't have much of him reflecting on his own past, which would be really helpful to know what this person who would give give their life or their faith really thought. We actually only have one letter of him reflecting on his own past. And he was a good German German. I mean, he wasn't into talking about himself, you know. So um, we have this one letter, and he's writing his friend, Everett Betka. He says, there's two things that impacted me more than anything else in my life. He says, the first was the time I spent in New York City in 1930 and 1931. And if you know his biography, you know some of the reasons why. The second thing he said that impacted me more than anything else was Papa's personality. And he's referring to his father, Karl Bonhoeffer who was a very important Berliner. He was actually the chair of psychiatry at the University of Berlin. If you know your, if you know your World War II history, you know that um, Hitler actually took over both the chancellor and the, president, uh, and the presidency by, um, by burning, having the National Socialists burn down the Reichstag and blame it on the communists. And they actually blamed it on a young communist activist. And it was actually Karl Bonhoeffer as the leading psychological voice in Germany at the time that did the psychological review on this young man. He had to determine if he was fit for trial. Um, and fit for trial. He said he was, and they, they killed him. He was a very important Berlin man. Dietrich came from a big family, seven brothers and sisters. And when they would come to dinner, they were absolutely 100%, it was an iron rule, that no one was allowed to talk unless they'd been spoken to. And when they did speak, even three, four-year-olds, when they did speak, they had to speak directly. So coming to dinner, if Sabine, Dietrich's sister, was asked how school was, and she said, well, you know, it was kind of like, well, I guess it was sort of Karl Bonhoeffer would pound his fist as hard as he could on the table and say, speak directly. And Dietrich's writing his friend Arbor Becca now, um, in the last days of his life, saying, you know, the thing that impacted me more than anything else was Papa's personality. And we're all thinking, yeah, because the guy was a raging jerk. But Dietrich actually means it very positively. He says, the thing I think I learned from Papa was that when one does theology, one must speak directly. That there is no place for loose phrases. There is no place to entertain the idol of phraseology. One must speak directly. Now, if I think there's anything that has to form our practice and ministry with the younger generations of people, it's to speak directly. To speak directly about the nightmares in the closet to speak directly about what it means to wrestle with God together, to speak directly about our confession of Jesus Christ and the gifts of the church, but it's to speak directly. And I think if we've done one disservice to children, to adolescents, to young adults, is that we haven't known how or we haven't been taught to speak directly. And I think that's in many ways where it starts, by actually really wrestling with them in the midst of it. Now, I could kill you with more stories about my children and things like that, but it's becoming time for wine, um, and that seems really exciting to me. Um, so let me stop, and I think we have a few minutes here, um, five minutes. See, I talked too long. Um, but what would be helpful? What connections do you make? What, um, what would help you have clarification on? Um, again, what connections do you make? Yes. I, I was surprised that you uh, didn't say more about it. Mm-hmm. and the change over generations. So, uh, you know, like my parents and grandparents' generations had things like uh, the Rotary Club, not to mention church. And so, how does what you said uh, interact with stuff like people like Putnam? Yeah. And, uh, and also, uh, I forget the authors, but the, the idea of the big sort mm-hmm. and, you know, the increasing polarization mm-hmm. of communities in mm-hmm. the United States. Um, because it does seem like people in my generation um, are looking for community. I know that sounds trite to hear yeah. a lot, but I, I, I think it's true. And it is really true. And, and some of this stuff comes from my book, The Promise of Despair, and I actually have a chapter. It's, it's the feel-good book of the year. It's called The Promise of Despair. Um, and there's a chapter in there that, that looks at community directly because it has been one of the things in one of the young adult expressions of ministry in reimagining ecclesiology for young adults has been to be about community and for, for things to really be about community. Um, and I'm all for that. I mean, I'm really all for it, but I think it's much harder said than done. And what I mean by that is, um, at least some social theorists, and here I'll lean on Bauman again, is he has actually this little book called Community. And one of the things he says that's essential from a social, from a social perspective, from a social theory perspective, for community to actually function um, is that it, it's often been based on obligation. That people feel obligated to each other. And um, this is, Ferdinand Tunia's understanding of the, the Gemeinschaft and the Gazelle Chef. 
that in the mind shaft, in the community, that you feel obligated. And that's not to be nostalgic. I mean, we tend to be very nostalgic about community. But if you're in a community and your father is the village drunk, guess what your destiny is? You know, it's not all that warm and fuzzy. Um, but in the gazelle shaft, you know, you're kind of free and you, you bounce around. And I think part of the issue is that we want community, but it becomes really hard in a cultural context where we can choose in and out of communities. And we can have these communities, but we choose in and out of them around preference, taste, and choice. You know, so I can be in community for a while, but as soon as I'm done with it, I can move on for it. So I think it leads those of us who are helping people think about how to construct religious communities or leading them ourselves to think about how will we, what will bind us together here. Um, now, one of the things that I, sh- I showed earlier was this slide. I don't know if anyone's seen um, Peter Berger's Portalization of Life Worlds. Um, this idea that, that we live in multiple different spheres and different worlds. I mean, call it religion, call it work, I mean, all, all these, and we have to negotiate these things. And I don't know if you guys do it in um, the Episcopal tradition, but when, um, when you baptize a child, you guys walk the child out into the congregation and tell the church. I mean, this has never happened, I don't think, or it's rare that it's ever happened. Where It's the same in, in both the PCUSA, uh, where I worship, and within the ELCA, where I teach, where the, the pastor will take the child out after baptism and say, now you all have made promises to this child to pass on the faith of this child, to be there for this child. Now, there's no one who sits in those pews and goes, wait, what? Promises? Oh, shit. <laughs> I'm, I just interviewed for a job, and if I get it, I'm moving to Chicago. Like, I can't, I, Pastor, I can't make this promise today because I don't think we're going to be here. No one thinks that. Because what they're essentially thinking is in the sphere of religion, I'm making this promise. But that doesn't set the terms for what I'll do in the work sphere. And if the work sphere makes me mobile, then I have to be mobile. So it, you can have community, but it always, I think, runs the risk of being, as Anthony Giddens says, community until further notice. Um, and so it's not to say there can't be real, real deep experiences of community. I think there really can be. The problem is, is that, I mean, all right, maybe the greatest text of my generation, well, which would be Seinfeld, but the next one would be Friends. You remember Friends? Why am I saying this? Um, but you remember Friends, like, it was a big issue when Chandler and Monica were going to have a baby because this real community of friends that they had, real community, it was now going to change just because they, they were going to move outside the city and go raise this kid and it threw up everything in the air. And I completely lost you with this analogy. Um, but you see how that, that threatens, it's a real community until further notice. And I think that becomes a challenge for us to think about the church, what it means to be in community, what will actually hold us together. And one of the things I'm proposing, that this is kind of some of the Lutheran texts that I work in the theology of the cross and things like that, and this kind of existential impulse of um, a, a Lutheran, pseudo-Lutheran theology, is this understanding of what it would actually mean to share deeply in each other's places of death. Not because we worship death, we hate death, but because we trust this God, Allah uh, Eberhardian, that God, this God that we worship always moves from nothingness to possibility, from death to life. This paradigm of from death to life. So that, I mean, just think of, if, that, if that's how I would answer this where question, where is Jesus Christ? I would follow Luther and, and Eberhard, and I'm going to say God is at the places of death, working death out of, working life out of death, breaking death through with life. Well, as a pastor, as a youth worker, what that means is my formative action is to be brave enough to call a thing what it is, as Luther said in the Heidelberg Disputation. To find places of death and speak places of death, not because I like them, not because I want to wallow in them, but because I believe this God of the cross moves from death to life. So my practice becomes calling a thing what it is. To say to, say to young people, to say to this young person I'm walking with, I can't, yeah, to feel rejected. That sucks, man. I mean, I understand. That is a, a real experience of death and nothingness. And then to bear to bear his humanity with him, trusting them in the midst of sharing in that, that God moves within it. So that's not to say that is the theological move to make. Clearly it's not. But what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to help my students do is connect their articulation of who this God is and how this God moves with the very practices that they take. And in youth ministry particularly, there's an incredible disconnect. So the practice we take on is because they work for the evangelical free church down the street, so we'll use them, um, but they have no way of connecting with a larger theological imagination. 
that then fundamentally kids graduate from high school and then we find out that they don't want anything to do with the faith when they're you know, 24, 25 and we wonder, well, what happened? Well, we never actually talked about what well, we had are kids who could be happy, shiny kids, who could be our trophies, who had high social capital, who could assimilate to our religious perspective. But when they actually ran into having to wrestle with God, they saw nothing here. Uh, so, even here, I'll just ramble on and on, and I think it's time for us to get a little bummed. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs>